Hi, so we are the panel representative of direct democracy. Um, it's the kind of panel that we could spend days discussing, similar like the rest of them. Broad uh, and generic, but people will address it through their own work. Um, I have only uh, two set of, I'll be very brief, two set of uh, two different ways for panelists to address it, um, which is to address the economic and material side of possibilities for participation in whatever way you spend in your work and whatever experiences you want to share theoretically or, or directly as a participant, I think it's irrelevant. Uh, so economic and material conditions of participation and the second thing is institutional side of it, which is to say the rules and conditions either prescribed by the state in the constitution or uh, enacted by local political parties, NGOs, arms of the state, whatever we want to call it. So the material side and the, the uh, institutional side of, of participation. Um, I delegated the work consensually for people to introduce themselves. So uh, can we say, start from uh, uh, Costas, please? Uh, would you just say, uh, and you've got five minutes then to, uh, to, introduce, to introduce yourself, yes, and which institution you work. And okay, I'm Costas Duzinas. I was born in Greece, but I live, I've lived all my life in London, and I come from the University of London. Uh, and uh, five, six minutes uh, to... Yeah. Say more. Yeah. Okay, that's the five or six minutes. Okay, five or six minutes. Yeah. Um, I'll start with three theses. First is that Europe is dying. Second, Greece is the future of Europe. And third, 2011 was a very long year. It is still taking place right now. 2011 started in 2008, keeping to Western Europe in the great insurrection in Athens, where young people over two weeks basically ruled the center of Athens. The police were not there. People uh, and young people occupied some 800 schools, not just in Athens, all over Greece, and basically acquired a huge sense of freedom that was then repeated, and we have lots of evidence of that, in Tahrir Square and in the Indignados and the, um, of course, Syntagma Square occupations. So that 2011 started in 2008. 2010, we had North Africa. 2011, we had Puerto del Sol, Athens, and so on. In 2012, we had the beginning of the fight back now, even in parliamentary terms, with the amazing victory of Syriza in the uh, last elections uh, in May 6. And the response, when I say Europe is dying, the response of the uh, leadership of the European Union and of Germany was precisely to try and terrorize the Greek people not to go to the left. And you had there, in the activities before the elections, even more so, a direct use of the politics of fear to stop that movement towards the left. But to link it with the question of democracy, my argument is that without what happened in 2008 in the Athens insurrection, without the indignados and the agonactismen in Syntagma Square in 2011, Syriza would not have won the way it did and would not have the prospect, as it now has, to form the first ever radical left government in Western Europe ever. <laughs> What do I mean by that, and linking it with the idea of democracy? Democracy, as you all know, is the kratos, the force or the power of the demos. But the demos is not the people in the general sense that people understand it. The demos is precisely the rule of those who do not have the competence or ability or wealth or power or wisdom to rule. The demos in classical Athens was precisely both the whole population of Athens, but also those who were excluded. And when the demos asked to be included and to become the rulers 
in classical Athens, they asked for two things. First of all, that everyone and anyone should become part of ruling, but also that they excluded those who did not have those standard qualifications to rule should become rulers. So we have in democracy, in that idea of democracy, of direct democracy as it is being discussed here, those two aspects, everyone and anyone and the excluded. In other words, in terms of contemporary politics, that kind of democracy asks for two types of strategies, two types of approaches and political interventions. One is what we would call a conflictual intervention in favor of those who are excluded, who are invisible to the political system, and therefore they do not have any particular stake in what is happening in the country, and that was the case of the insurrections of the Athens 2008, that kind of acting out with certain violent uh, explosions in it. But then secondly, you need also the hegemonic block, the hegemonic policy that will find within the social body certain key uh, key uh, divisions, dividing lines, and therefore build a popular bloc against the bloc of uh, the uh, economic and powerful elites. And to that extent, when I say that the squares voted for Syriza, and Syriza's victory would not have happened without the squares, I mean two things, and perhaps there I, I will finish, and then if you want the more theoretical stuff, I can say it later. When the youth, the excluded, invisible youth of Athens, and currently, and of Greece, currently over 50% of 18 to 25 years old are unemployed and unemployable. This is what one could call a genocide, not genocide, the killing of a whole generation. It happens in Spain, it happens all over Europe, but of course Greece and Spain are the key things. When these people, in a conflictual, acting out way, in an immediate uh, activity out in the streets, in a sense said, we don't want this or that. We don't want this right or the other right. We want the right to have rights. We want a reorganization and rearrangement of the, uh, of the political and of the social system and a political recognition. They had to become and they did become conflictual and even violent. So that was the first kind of immediate and acting out and even violent activity which brought those invisible into the political system and to do that it had to change the rules of visibility, what it means to be politically visible. What now the squares did were precisely to turn this first negative, this negation of the rules of visibility, of political recognition and so on, to change it from that into a demonstration. By demonstration, I mean a monstration, a coming out in public and creating the conditions of a direct democratic uh, uh, assembly and so on. Now, of course, in Hegelian terms, this is obviously the second part of what the creation of both subjectivities uh, of disobedience, but also of a political subject. As we know in Hegel, the first move of the subject is a saying no. Enough is enough. The second is to go out in the world, to go out in the world and present to the world our own personality, our own activity, and get that monstration, that recognition. That happens in the square. And the third, uh, the third step, which is the coming back again after going out in the world through the agency of a political uh, a coalition of political parties, which then claims precisely the creation of the completed political subject. To that extent, direct democracy, in my understanding of the term, is neither just for squares and being together and debating and arguing and deciding and acting as a multitude, important as that is, it is that plus the acceptance that eventually political subjectivity has also to pass, particularly if you're interested in taking over the state, as is the case in, in Greece and in many other uh, countries where the left is strong, to act through a political agency so that to complete the transformation of society. So what is happening here is a combination of those types of direct democratic activity that creates subjectivities that are now to a certain extent 
free, emancipated from the biopolitical type of capitalism, which told us that the only principle in life in the 90s and the early 2000s is to consume. Where if every I want becomes I have a right to this something. That idea that through debt, through consumption, the big existential question, do I want an iPhone or a Nokia? That kind of activity was changed in the squares. It was changed through the disarticulation of the consuming subjectivity of neoliberal capitalism, and then through the completion in the political process, which, however, is precisely a completion and companion of that part of direct democracy which created the precondition <coughs> for the victory of Syriza and the radical left, we can now see, perhaps for the first time in Europe, the movement towards a, a proper left and radical left government. So in my mind, while those two traditions, the democratic tradition and the representative tradition, are absolutely not identical, for the largest part of history, they were actually conflictual. What we have now, for the first time in 200 years, realized is that the bringing back of direct democracy, rather than being just opposed, antagonistic to parliamentary politics of the left, can precisely create both the political individual subjectivities, but also the political subject that can change the world. Costas, phenomenal. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think he deserves. Worth every four, four minutes uh, over the limit. That was uh, good, so, good for my phone. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, yes, so six, seven minutes to be a bit more fair, not five anymore, obviously. Uh, Hello. Uh, and introduce yourself, please. Um, my name is Barbara Steiner, and uh, I work in Transform office in Vienna. I come from Austria, and I'm a political scientist. Um, well, um, I'm glad to share my thoughts uh, with you here, and uh, um, especially I uh, would be keen on sharing uh, my thoughts with you, uh, having a Balkans or Croatian perspective, so that is what I also asked T Tony, maybe he could uh, um, elaborate his thoughts on, on direct and representative uh, democracy later. Um, in, like from the perspective uh, from here, uh, where we are at the moment, uh, in, in Zagreb. Well, uh, I wanted to start with a personal experience I had with the democracies. And, uh, well, I have been active uh, in the Communist Students Association in Vienna for years. And uh, there we had uh, me and my comrades had also um, the taste um, of uh, being elected a representative mandate uh, in the students' union. And uh, there we always uh, tried uh, to like, work together with the grassroots uh, students' movement, which have a, a long tradition in Vienna since the 70s, uh, which are um, based on the level of the institutes and faculties. And we were like in the ex executive uh, on the university. And um, well, um, this was okay. The taste was not that vivid, um, more or less. It, it was a lot of bureaucracy. All that uh, comes, of course, with the uh, representative democracy as well. And yeah, maybe not so exciting sometimes. Um, at university, I experienced uh, the most uh, like uh, uh, high points of direct democracy and the most uh, vivid and um, moments of creative protest and uh, of, um, you know, like uh, really where something is moving and a very broad euphoric participation is possible uh, in times of occupations, in times of protests against certain uh, political decisions and uh, which sometimes also very spontaneously evolved. And, um, but here I, yes, I learned there a lot. And, but at the same time, I want uh, to mention uh, only two problems uh, that always arouse then. Um, first, the exclusion of the academic uh, right-wing fraternities of sexists and of racists were not always clear from the beginning. This was also a struggle. That the minority rights, 
So to protect minorities uh, against discrimination has to exclude people, namely those people who want to spread their ideas, their discriminating ideas. So, and uh, especially the question of gender democracy, from these three was always the hardest to reach, to make clear that the uh, speech time has to be uh, equally um, uh, distributed between the genders and to make clear that sexist comments are an absolute no-go. I mean, I'm talking here of really broad participation of people who are not active in the, in, before in some leftist uh, movement who got politicized there. So this was the first problem. And secondly, <laughs> and this is also the problem within the traditional grassroots uh, students um, movement, um, those who have the, law, we say, who have the better uh, flesh on the bottom, um, they, they decide. So those who uh, have patience, those who have time, they decide in the end. So um, it, this is a question of uh, economic resources. It's a question of time, it's a question of uh, rhetoric also, it's a question of education, it's a question if you have uh, duties to uh, care for somebody at home and so on. So, um, this is the personal experience and um, um, where I find solution is um, a possible solution, but it's not no solution, but maybe a, a thought that could be helpful is Rosa Luxemburg. In her uh, not pu published 1918 uh, critical uh, essay on the Ru Russian Revolution. And uh, <laughs> she states there that uh, the basis should be able to decide everything, and, but out of technical and practical reasons, they elect representatives. So that might be not very new and uh, <laughs> Yeah, you might excuse. Here is to mention the idea and the concept of the imperative mandate, or like the Zapatistas would have drawn it, uh, governing by obeying, or progressing, always questioning. So this is what fascinates me, and here we come to economics and resources again. Luxembourg also stated, and here I want to quote her. <clears throat> We have always revealed the hard kernel of social inequality and lack of freedom hidden under the sweet shell of formal equality and freedom. So she says to the masses, don't be satisfied with the sweet shell uh, like uh, liberal freedoms, liberal democracy, but don't replace it then, but fight for both the liberal freedom rights and the social equality. This is, in her view, a socialist democracy. So we have the economic basis uh, and the liberal freedom rights, the, social, the question of social equality and of resources and of social obvious existing inequalities. So democracy, I think, is always in a crisis. So, um, uh, like we heard yesterday, it's uh, not in a crisis only on transnational level, on the EU level, it's also in the uh, state level. And uh, so either we have the so-called real existing socialism in terms of liberal freedom rights, we have the crisis here, or uh, we have the uh, capitalist states uh, when it comes to which have inherent the social inequality. So uh, even though when we had for decades the compromises between work and capital. So, and uh, I want to also um, connect to what was said yesterday in the audience that it was after 89 not the democracy and uh, not the social model who was, uh, which was exported to the um, to the former state socialist countries. It was the hardcore capitalism, it was rough capitalism in its uh, roughest way and uh, also with the missing um, systemic opponent um, for the former uh, welfare state uh, European uh, countries. Now this, there is no alternative dogma was easier to bring through in the, in the Western countries. So, well, it's always in crisis, uh, and uh, I don't know if I have time for the... Yeah, another minute. Last, another minute. Okay, thank you. And, um, well, 
what we see in the in the uh, European level now is uh, well, it's the attack on the working classes, and it's the austeritarian, like Christoph put it, or authoritarian uh, policies by the ruling oligarchies. It's uh, uh, they still need a state, like we also heard yesterday, and they still preserve the elections, like we can read in the introductory text. So, but those elections are like to talk about democracies sometimes quite hard when we um, see like what uh, enormous impact the lobbying has, the campaign costs, how high they are, and the role of the media that was also put forward yesterday, which is quite uh, important, which is not any longer a body of control uh, towards the, the politics, but rather corrupt and rather forming and shaping politics in direction of polytainment. So, um, yeah and uh, instead of yeah, being like uh, critical to politics. So, um, yeah, I'll finish here. Thanks <laughs> Thank so you. much. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, may I? Okay. <clears throat> My name is Giovanni Allegretti. I'm Sardinian, which means I'm Italian also. And uh, I come from Portugal, where I work at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. As a, um, uh, an activist, I like to participate in o occupying spaces. That means uh, when, uh, when we don't have given spaces to participate uh, to take the space, the public space, to, to make uh, our uh, points of view visible. But as a practitioner, as a professional, I work since 15 years in uh, experiences of participatory democracy, uh, which are institutionalized. So spaces given by political power, mainly at local or regional level, where people can express their point of view and uh, co-participate to some of the, uh, the decision of the management of uh, the territory and the discussion on the commons. Um, uh, I want to start with, uh, uh, with one reflection that uh, Zizek uh, uh, did last day, is that we need uh, uh, experiences, especially in this moment of crisis, uh, that disturb ideological prejudice, but that could be totally feasible. So it's what I actually work uh, with. So uh, I, I think that the, the sea is, done, is made out of drops, so uh, that uh, there are a lot of small experiences that we can uh, can do in the daily life uh, in our uh, small spaces of action, uh, which uh, can be revolutionary. Revolutionary because they try to uh, create a new society which is done of listening in the others, which is not uh, so uh, common. Uh, also, I, I work with a lot of municipalities uh, from the left, and I face every day uh, this idea of the selfish left uh, who does not want to listen to the others and likes a lot to speak only among similars. I don't think that we can do real participation if we only listen uh, to similar people. We, we must deal with the differences, knowing that differences continue to exist. If we don't want to, if don't, we don't want, but they continue to exist. So. And it's a hard job to convince the other that something is good, then to impose our vision to the other. So that's the way in which I work uh, with participation. And that's why I, I'm a little bit critical on the title of this uh, panel, because uh, I would uh, I see just direct democracy possibly in the, in the form uh, in which it's described in, uh, in many uh, new uh, dictionaries, uh, in which uh, it's uh, thought as uh, mainly as a sort of uh, institutional series of instruments uh, uh, that can integrate the representative democracy in some moments, uh, and uh, like happens with referendum or with petitions, in many cases they can be extremely reductive of the complexity of reality. Uh, I think that when we deal uh, with uh, the issue of participation, we must deal with the variable geometry of uh, deliberative democracy's experiment.
argument, so those which are centered mainly in the discussion and an exchange of argumentation between different people, uh, experience of participatory democracy, which are more interested to create uh, common results together through consensus or also through majority in some cases, and uh, experiences of di democracy which try to enlarge, also in an institutional way, to everybody, not only the formal citizens, but in some cases, for example, many local referendum, uh, they allow to vote uh, uh, immigrants uh, which are uh, live in the city but not uh, formal citizen, uh, uh, young people which is not entitled to vote, so they are trying to enlarge the scope of the representative democracy. So with this variable geometry, I think that we have to deal with another issue which is transcalarity of actions. Um, in, in the left, I see two uh, not dialoguing movements sometimes. A group of internationalists which think that only global dreams matters, and another group of people with works every day in the local context, and they are concentrated in changing the reality and the perception of people, and sometimes they forget networking. And so if they don't do critical mass, this spirit will be minority, and they will not change the paradigm and, and the political and civic culture. So I think that we have a responsibility has left to make these uh, tracks uh, of our battle dialogue more. I'm thinking of something that I have been studying in the last year, which is the situation of Brazil, where, for example, in 2001, the law on coal statutes of the city has been approved. Uh, with a large majority, quite unanimity, in a parliament that was at the time dominated by the president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, uh, why they managed to approve this, uh, this law, which is the most progressive law in terms of urban reform. Because they did 15 years of experiment before, and a parallel battle of 3,000 social movements uh, which worked at the national level, trying to use uh, as a leverage uh, what has been successful at local level. So I think this kind of articulation is what you need uh, at national levels, but also at uh, continental level. Um, in, in this case, I, I wanted to add uh, one thing on the issue on direct democracy as uh, a risk of uh, simplification of issues. I, I'm thinking about some referendum in Switzerland or the e-petition that uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister Cameron uh, introduced in, in UK, which gave as a first result uh, a group of 1,000 people that were asking to the parliament to debate uh, the reestablishment of uh, the dead uh, penalty in UK. So uh, I think that the uh, simplification of issues is very dangerous. And so for me, uh, the integration between democracy and long moments of participation in which you build together the questions of the referendum, it's uh, very important. Uh, I see as a, an important uh, uh, central issue of the left uh, that of uh, uh, avoiding all the systems that are just summing preferences. Because that is what we are doing with uh, many of the uh, so-called uh, e-voting. Uh, we are just summing individuals' uh, preferences without a, a creation of a common space in which people are uh, forced to listen to each other with clear rules. And uh, this summing of preferences is, is what I see as something more uh, feasible for the rights, which has uh, simplification, in my view, in its uh, DNA. I think that the, the, the left has to face a problem. Reality is complex. We cannot, if we simplify it, we are just faking it simple, as uh, reducing everything to a slogan. So I think uh, that we have to find how to inform uh, people uh, through learning by doing spaces in which co-decide and we learn how reality is complex uh, and to try from this to re-establish a good access uh, uh, to the understanding of complexity. I think I have to finish. So I finish with this uh, reflection about uh, uh, um, for, uh, building, uh, for building, for dealing with complexity, we need a lot of uh, transparency and accountability, but we have to escape from the neoliberal interpretation of this concept, uh, which is usually coinciding with uh, uh, displaying a lot of uh, 
sometimes useless, sometimes useful data, and leaving to the people uh, the responsibility to make sense of them. Because uh, these data sometimes are so complex that nobody uh, could interpret them. Imagine, imagine that uh, all the data of Greece that have been uh, hidden for a long time uh, uh, were displayed. They were a thousand and thousand of books that uh, possibly nobody of us and many politicians could not even read. So the problem is to create a different, uh, different levels of understanding of the things that we are displaying in order to grant access to different level of knowledge and skills. And uh, the last thing is uh, to try to avoid uh, participatory Jacobinism. This is a a sentence uh, uh, used by uh, the historian, uh, in English historian Paul Ginsburg, which is a, a big activist also in Italy, creating now a new political entity. Um, because uh, people has limited time and has the right in a world of work which is taken out of our time to have affects, to have family, to have loves, to go to cinema. So if we propose a lot, a too much participation on everything, we will have that Darwinian selection that Barbara was mentioning before, in which finally who decides in the end of the day, uh, it's only the people who's more perseverant, has more resources of time and money to stay and participate. So I think that rules are really needed in participation in order to guarantee this equal access to everybody. Thanks. Sorry. Um, Peter and David, so you yes. can introduce yourself. And, and Thank get you. Away. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Peter Vermeers, and on my left side is uh, David van Rijbroek. Um, we are going to present together, we are going to try to talk together as well about a very specific project, an experiment in uh, deliberative democracy and innovation in democracy, which we <laughs> implemented with a group of people in Belgium uh, and actually are still implementing uh, today. Um, and David will talk a little bit about the specifics of this particular project, but let me perhaps preface um, the, um, that, that story of the details with uh, a few things about Belgium, uh, which is sort of the um, the roots where our project uh, was uh, was coming from, and um, so last year, uh, uh, since 2010, in fact, there has been a, 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 a very severe political crisis in Belgium. There wasn't a government for uh, more than 500 days, and um, that situation of crisis, uh, it occurred to us, presented a certain opportunity for uh, democratic innovation. Um, uh, within that context of not having a government, a lot of groups were doing protests, going on the streets. Sometimes these protests were very, very funny. Uh, we had the French fry revolution, for example, people uh, protesting on the streets, eating French fries and so on. Uh, the, the general atmosphere of it was the situation is hopeless but not serious. Uh, but in that context, we thought maybe uh, there is some uh, reason for hope uh, within this context because it opens up uh, space for new ideas to think about what is representative democracy, w democracy, what is the world of party politics and party competition um, meaning today and how can we add to that. And within this context we came up with the idea of uh, experimenting with uh, a form of deliber deliberative democracy, an initiative of deliberative democracy called the G1000. David, perhaps you can go on. The G1000 had a very simple idea. Our idea was democracy is a permanent struggle. It's never over. It has to innovate. It's an ongoing process. And we believed it was important the moment that during 500 days, politicians were trying to form a government. We said, like, if that is impossible, invite citizens in. You asked us to vote, but we can also talk. And here were some of the few ideas. We believe that the real big challenge is that the crisis in Belgium was not just a Belgian crisis. It was a crisis of democracy. And you saw it in many other countries as well. We've been talking about Spain, we've been talking about Greece. Uh, Holland had a minority cabinet for the first time in its history. Britain has a coalition cabinet for the first time in many, many years. And Belgium had no cabinet. So you see, it's a bigger, it's a bigger process. And the real deeper cause is that democracy has been reduced to elections. Now, there's much more to democracy than elections. 
representative democracy, the result of elections, representative democracy is no longer representative. I mean, this is a challenge. Those in parliament do not longer represent uh, the file and rank of a society. They do represent party interests. And you see within negotiations an ongoing discussion between political parties. For the very first time in history, and this is unique, for the very first time in history, we see that the weight of the next elections is more important than the weight of the previous elections. And that creates a permanent atmosphere of uneasiness, of unrest. And it's quite unusual. It is quite unusual. Uh, and it has certainly to do with the arrival of social media. Facebook, Twitter, online forums of newspapers create the culture of constant feedback. As such, it's a powerful tool, but we're not using it very intelligently. It's mostly used as a way of paralyzing politicians. Now, this was a little bit the background to the G1000 project. And we said, like, we'll be very simple. We call our project the G1000, and it's an ironic reference to the G8 or the G20. Our idea was we bring together a thousand Belgian citizens on one day to talk about the future of the country to talk about the big challenges this country is facing. And we said, like, the thousand will not have been able to report themselves, because that way we will get middle-class people, highly educated, highly informed, highly motivated. No, we wanted to have, like, a real good sample of the Belgian population. And we did it by using a random sample. It's a difficult procedure. It's a more expensive procedure. But we managed. We found a thousand people representing the diversity, maximal diversity of uh, Belgian population. We did it through a phone uh, inquiry by a, an independent uh, research uh, bureau who did it for a couple of weeks. And then uh, for the last hundred of the thousand, we worked through civil society organizations in order to be sure that you have homeless people, that you have working class people, that you have people from ethnic and cultural minorities. And all those people came together on 11 November last year in Brussels. It was 11, 11, 11. It's Armistice Day in Belgium. And it was also somehow a citizen's armistice against the ongoing conflictual atmosphere within uh, Belgian political negotiation at the time. Now, the idea was not to do away with conflict. The idea was not to pretend that was no place for dissensus. It was actually a celebration of difference. People were sitting at 100 different tables in a massive late industrial complex in Brussels called Tour and Taxis. You had people on the stage and then 100 tables, and every table had a maximal diversity of people. You should go to the website g1000.org. You have some great pictures about people sitting there. And we made sure you had maximal diversity on each and every table. Each and every table had a professional facilitator, all of them volunteers. We found 800 volunteers to work with this within five days. We had to find 300,000 euros. We found them in, uh, in less than three months. Peter, perhaps you can say something more about how the process evolved. Yeah, what, what's, what was really striking when you had all these people in the room uh, is that these people were very involved in, in these discussions. Uh, these were people who had never been uh, given the ability to talk really about politics outside of their homes. And um, we were a little afraid that they wouldn't take the, 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 the discussions very seriously. They actually did. Uh, people felt that um, the, 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 the traditional institutions of representative democracy, namely elections and party politics, was limiting for them. Uh, they could vote, and they were happy. In, in fact, in Belgium, you're obliged to vote. So some of them are happy to vote. But some of them are frustrated. A lot of them are frustrated because they cannot talk about what the reasons is, what the reasons are, why they vote for this or that party or this or that politician. Now, this context of the G1000 offered a lot of people the opportunity to do that and to think actually beyond the model of classic strategic bargaining and going into interaction with other citizens and coming up with new ideas. So it's actually a very creative event for the people involved with it. Um, apart from the impact that that can have on policies and on politics, it also had a clear impact on the participants in this room uh, in the, in, uh, at the event because they felt empowered. They no longer felt um, that a politics, they, that they were alienated from, uh, from politics but they actually could participate and that they had a meaningful say in society. So 
it's important what happened on that day, the 11th of, of November, uh, with those people, because afterwards they will surely feel more powerful and uh, feel that they can have a say uh, within society. So the, the, in, the impact of the event stretches beyond the event uh, itself. We can perhaps talk yeah. two time. more figures. Only two people walked out. It was a beautiful day. It was very sunny. Only two people walked out. And on the 100 tables, there hasn't been any fight on any of the tables. I think that was important. While people were still disagreeing on these tables on certain policy issues. But we can Thanks. talk about that later. Thanks a lot. Cheers. So I've been asked by Barbara to talk about the Croatian experience, but I won't because there are people who can talk better than I can, and I've written too much about it anyway. Okay, so when we occupied our, universe, our faculty of humanities and social sciences back in 2009, we, uh, we decided that we are going to function on uh, principles of direct democracy. So uh, Croatia is a small country of 4 million people and Zagreb uh, has uh, 1 million uh, uh, inhabitants. And out of that, 60, 100,000 students only in Zagreb. Uh, our faculty is the biggest in the country. It has five to 6,000 students. And out of that, uh, we had each night 1,000 people approximately at, uh, at the plenary sessions that were every day at 9 o'clock uh, at night uh, to, uh, to discuss everything that was, everything that was important uh, and that has to do with, uh, um, with the occupation, whether it was organizational issues or political issues. So the, the, that was the main, uh, the main forum for discussion. But we also had working groups all day long, starting sometimes from 8 a.m. if it was important. And we had different groups, working groups, uh, for example, the analysis of documents and uh, the uh, uh, journalist section or media section and uh, uh, the program section, which was, which was extremely important for us because that was the, the, the group through which we, um, we uh, offered our alternative programs. So it was, the idea was the faculty was to remain open all the time. It was to be open for everyone, not just for students, but for everyone who wanted to come and uh, to, to participate in whatever way. And it, it, um, it was a good decision because that was one of the... Uh, the um, that was one of the things that attracted many people who weren't students. So it, uh, it enabled us uh, uh, a wider support that, uh, that went beyond faculty and went beyond the academia. And uh, um, what was important is that all uh, uh, representatives of uh, students in a faculty council that has 80 members of uh, each and every section of the faculty uh, get, uh, they gave up their le le legitimacy. So uh, er, uh, every time uh, the, the council was in session, they asked for, uh, for student uh, uh, delegates from the plenum to come and to, to, to say what did plenum decide uh, the, the previous night. So it was, uh, um, the support was really big uh, at that time, because it was something new, it wasn't that everybody was so politically articulated. It's not that everybody knew what's going on and what we're doing. It's not that all of us knew what we're doing, but uh, it was uh, uh, it, it it kind of functioned because uh, uh, the plenary sessions were um, were um, were the main places of debate, and uh, uh, I don't know what else to add. <laughs> Uh, now let's open the floor, but before we do, I'll just try to sum up just a few, few things I've... So, the making people feel empowered to participate and not walking out, despite your pessimistic uh, expectations at the start, perhaps, and occupy. Uh, and um, I like the exclusion in order to include, if anything, that's been a big lesson of, of every single uh, political activism I, I took part of. I mean, the, the long history, if we even look at the either labor movement or, or the parties have always had that question. Uh, but often they closed down their venues of, of reaching out and being part of a wider political movement rather than just becoming a vehicles on their own, talking among them, themselves, like, like you said. 
and and, uh, and the message from Costas and no squares, no elections. Yeah, the Greece lesson. Um, it'll be interesting whether it'll, it'll become a uh, a pattern that will that will be repeated. But it will give you political asylum. That's fine. We, we've already discussed that they will have to have a barbed wire because all the lefties that will flock down to Greece to ask for the asylum once Syriza takes, uh, takes power. Um, this is the book uh, that Costas asked me to plug and I will gladly do so. Uh, Costas, it's called, the book is called... Resistance and Philosophy in the Crisis. In the Crisis. Questions, please. Let's see five or six around. Uh, uh, yes, so one and two and three and four and five and six, and that's six is enough. So can we have the mic, please, around for? This is going to be a long day. So I'll, I'll say the time. So um, we should finish by quarter past. So we have 45 minutes. Around 40, yes. Yeah. If you want to continue, you can continue until 2.30 or something. We'll see how it goes, but obviously we should okay. be very short. And no, 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 I've been, no. No. No, no. If they the, say no, the people, then people it's no. who know better are saying no. Quarter past two. Okay, I'll be, I'll be also, also short. Um, 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 we are here, as we mentioned, we are, however, in a, in a, in a certain place. There is a town called Zagreb, we are in Croatia, that used to be part of Yugoslavia, the country that had the largest experiment probably ever in something that was not mentioned on the panel in an industrial democracy or democracy at the workplace. And as uh, uh, our friend uh, uh, mentioned, people spend most of their the time working like crazy and more and more and more, 10 to 12 hours, and they don't have time then to go to the municipal council and maybe decide on the matters uh, uh, that affect them on, on the daily basis. This is why direct democracy cannot be just uh, political, just in the political sphere or what is known as political sphere. Of course, workplace is the primary place of politics and of the struggle. It has to be also introduced at the level of, 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 of a workplace, at the level of factories or, or wherever we are. Those are the most hierarchical institutions where we are, including the academia where I am, or, or, or other places. You cannot be socialized in a hierarchical uh, uh, um, institution and then go outside of your workplace and participate in a, in a direct democratic forum. This doesn't work. Therefore, you cannot have this just little experiment here and there. You have to, to have it introduced at the daily, daily, daily level. And of course, uh, you go, this, uh, another lesson from Yugoslavia is how fast we forgot these achievements. I mean, Michael Lebowitz was so so uh, surprised when he came to the subversive two years ago, and he's basically exporting Yugoslav experience to Venezuela, saying, well, this was right, this was wrong, you should do it better this time. And then he came back here, and we all asked him, so how it was in Yugoslavia? And he said, but, but are you crazy? I was here 20 years ago to learn from you. Now you are asking me uh, what you were actually doing 30 years ago. So the, the, we forget easily these enormous successes uh, uh, um, that, that, that we have historical evidence of, and that could be possibly, hopefully, adapted to new circumstances. Thanks, thanks Igor. And uh, there, uh, second question, comment? Well, I thought I would add a non-European voice to this European discussion and um, bring some fun from Asia. Uh, and Vinod from India. And uh, the, what I would like to add to this is a historical context of two people who were antipathic to each other in many ways, uh, but were united in their uh, view about a different form of governance. And that's basically Gandhi and Mao. Um, in answer to a, a journalist, when Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, it's a good idea. <laughs> it would be a good idea. But he followed it up with a book called Hind, Hind Swaraj, which was self-rule in India where he sternly uh, rejected the British parliamentary system. And he said that this is an absolutely absurd idea, particularly in the Indian context. And formulated an alternative idea of not just governance, but governance, development, education taken together. Because what he said, and this is the point I would like to make, 
you cannot create governance systems unless they are mandated to work for development mm -hmm. and education. If there are referendums for particular events and issues, they are vacuous. And I think uh, this is an important idea which remained uh, in, in the Gandhian tradition of what we may call local governance, but it has a different connotation, which is caught by the Indian word called panchayat, uh, the rule by the people uh, at the local level, in which the most important aspect was that if you have someone representing more than 1,000 people, that person will not represent them because he cannot or she cannot be checked. But if it is 1,000 people, then he is li she is living in the vicinity and you can <coughs> check. So someone who is representing you know, one million people or half a million people in the national parliament is essentially unaccountable. So the accountability was much more important to it than any no notion of direct and so on. And incidentally, Mao had exactly the same idea in China. Even though the Gandhian, idea, Gandhian ideas were disliked by the uh, left in India, but this is one area where the left agreed and Mao agreed. And I would like to, I know there's not enough time for this. The point is that these are not no longer ideas in these countries. They are actually practicing systems. And it took all the way up to 1994 for the Indian state to realize that this should be constitutionally mandated as a system of governance in India. And since 1994, this Gandhian system of democracy of the people is actually practiced with a reservation for 33% women who must be part of it, and with a right to work, which mandates that every rural Indian has a right to work, which the state must fulfill, being given to this uh, governance system, along with many other responsibilities. And you can, I can feel, and, and with all the problems that it has, what an enormous change it can make to everyday decision making and living for ordinary people, though it may not stop you from international wars and things like those. And this is exactly the kind of system in China where the production system at the village level uh, flourished for a very long period of time, but related to the governance system. So I would like to say that both in terms of ideas and practice, there is enough available for us to forge newer systems of local governance, provided, as I said again, they are not tokenistic in terms of referendums on one particular event or point, but are related both to governance systems, and I would add very strongly to systems of education. Because to, finally, this is a change of mind. Yeah. And that cannot be done in centralized universities where governance is local. Thank Agreed. you. Thank you. There were three more questions on this side, but I've forgotten which ones here. Uh, we can start here with Thomas. I'm always very fascinated from the Segalian three steps, and so I was very fascinated from Costas Duzinas, but uh, with the second thought, then the question for how much is the amount of irony necessary to put in these and Yeah, yeah. So, and I, therefore, I would insist that uh, I think all these three steps are definitely necessary, but the follow-up will be always in question, and that will be in internally conflict. And that has to do with the topic of representative and direct democracy, where I think there is no uh, 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 solution to be found at a single point. It's an ongoing conflict. And I want to differentiate now some points of that. The first point, this has nothing to do with the so-called theories of radical democracy, where the excluded always again have to go out and then they are pushed down and then they have to go out again. Then, like Chantal Mouffen, this story of this always coming back, which means the position of the excluded remains. Thomas, just use the mic so that Okay, is, sorry. I can so there, yeah, yeah, yeah. There has to be uh, uh, points of final breaks. Like one point to quote is we have to get rid of capital. If we want to gain democracy, we have to get rid of capital. There is the question of a final break. And that's, that brings us back to, and that I want to insist, unsolved questions 
of the traditional left, not the answers, but unsolved questions. One of the questions is, it's not enough to talk about the demos. I like to talk about the demos. You do it, but that's a question of class politics, but we cannot go back to a traditional notion, notion of class, which we can see very clearly in all the struggles that this real existing working class is not at all a progressive factor. And that is not a question of the leadership, it's the question of the so-called constituency. So we have an unsolved question of class. We have an unsolved question then, and that is much related to the Belgian. I like somehow the idea, but there is something which I don't like on it. We have an unsolved question of the relationship between minority and majority. Forward stepping minority and backward stopping majority. We have to insist that democracy is not the question of majority rule, not at all. And so we are somehow thrown back to the old Leninist questions without Leninist answers, but we have the problem of minority. And that brings us to th two things I think uh, Karl Heinz was uh, mentioning in the morning already. We have to keep the lectures of the past. One lecture of the lecture of 68 is that we have this kind of politics of the subjective factor, of the politics in first position. That is which we cannot uh, forget. So we have the question of minority, majority, uh, that comes back then again to the Belgian point. Yes, of course, everybody has to be invited. But then we have the question of militancy and the militant not in the narrow sense of being violent, but of the, I don't want to talk with everybody and I don't want to have the racists and the stupid minded on the table and we have a problem with this and I don't want to go so far with Zizek and calling for a secret police, but we have a problem with this. Good yes, and then the, the point, uh, and therefore I want to stop with what Karl Heinz was insisting and was for somehow falling apart. Given the point that we have not to choose with representative or direct democracy, the question is where we put the hope on. And I would say neither of these two forms as such. The hope is on the unforeseen, and that is what you told, and that is the point I definitely agree. The ongoing year 2011, that was the unforeseen and that is the point where we said to the hope on, and that is beyond these formalist questions of representative or direct democracy. That's not the, the definite point. It's not the right question. Thank you so much. Uh, the mic up in uh, Ford and then it will come back there. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Emin. I come from Tuzla, Bosnia and Herzegovina. and. Um, yeah, so I'll put the straight obvious question first. Uh, should we be optimistic with, with regards to direct democracy? As to uh, my personal experience from our experiment of occupying our university in, in Tuzla was, uh, yeah, we had, as Costa said, we had this agonistic opposal toward, towards the parliamentary structure of, of the university gover governance at the moment, but um, at the end, uh, people coming to our plenary sessions, to, to our assemblies, were exactly those people from, from the parliamentary structures. And forgive me for being cynical right now, but uh, what happened with our experiment, it failed because these people, uh, members of various NGOs, political parties, uh, worker unions and, and whatnot, uh, they tore it apart. And so the question remains, can we be optimistic? Uh, I, for one, like to think that we can because uh, uh, what, what our experiment spawned in Tuzla especially was a, a sort of a new emancipatory politic towards the creation of, of, a, of a real left organization uh, as we have right now and whose representatives are sitting here next to me. Um, they're called the left. So that's basically it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can, there was someone there as well which I've forgotten about, but if not, Mike goes down. To Uh, there was a question there, or comment, whatever. Thank you. Um, I come from Belgium. <laughs> I should say that uh, in the first place. Oh, no, I would like to, to add one point um, uh, that is about the, the, what we have seen in Belgium is, in fact, the extraordinary strength of the system. 
I do not know whether we have to be happy about it or not. But if you look back at the whole period, during one year and a half, we had no government. And everything went on as usual. <laughs> Nobody noticed. We had no government. <laughs> during all that time, there were, or at least the first year, there were nine parties sitting together day after day, negotiating, seeking compromises, not succeeding, trying again, for a whole year, nine parties. Then one party was out, the party that wanted, in fact, the separation of Belgium, the splitting up. So that party went out, and the remaining six, and the Greens went out, the remaining six parties continued for another six months to seek solutions. Now, when I say the extraordinary strength of the system, it's because no one noticed that we had no government and we didn't miss it, really. The second point is that these parties did try to arrive at solutions for one year and a half, talking, 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 until they had a solution. And I think it shows well, again, I'm not sure, sure whether, whether we have to be happy about it or not. But the result is, it's even more extraordinary. We have a prime minister who is second generation migrant and openly say a homosexual. So this is really for a conservative country like Belgium, in fact, very special. But again, it's the strength of the system. It's is it democracy or is it a denial of democracy? Denial of democracy. We, we might differ on that. But it's, it's, I think it, is, it was a very special um, experience. Thank you. Can, uh, Catherine, uh, Mike. Yes. Um, uh, I wanted to say, what, what is the issue for us? I mean, I want to make a link with the other discussion we had before, that is the issue for the left uh, in, in the resistance. We are confronted to the, both to um, uh, uh, an enormous crisis of the representative democracy, and uh, first people are uh, elected but not controlled, uh, the, 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 the majority of issues which concern daily life are taken out of elections. And third, when, uh, 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 and you have also more and more non-elected bodies like the central banks and, uh, and so on, which uh, have uh, uh, official power, institutional power. So we have, of course, uh, to put forward the criticism of that kind of democracy and, uh, uh, and um, of course, stress the system behind it, uh, not only the, the recent evolution, but also all the issue of uh, economical, industrial powers, the question of ownership, and the, the limitation anyway, even in the past, of that kind of democracy when uh, you go into the factory and you have uh, no uh, power. So we have to, to, to discuss the question of resisting and, and, and fighting against the system, but to put in the balance sheet also all, and I finish with this, all the problem of the experience. And so we, we have, it will not be done in one hour, in one uh, session, uh, all what you, you have said of the, the past, especially the Yugoslav experience, self-management and so on. Um, uh, so we have to, to put together in our uh, common asset uh, lessons of, of the past, uh, both criticism of uh, direct democracy, uh, of uh, representative democracy, which does not mean we can, we can suppress it. Second, the question of uh, direct democracy, which doesn't mean we don't need uh, institutions to help it to function, uh, uh, and the articulation between individual and collective aspect with inequalities within uh, democracy, uh, women's issues, uh, racist issue, inequality between young and qualified and so on and so forth, uh, dissensus within democracy. So we have to, to really uh, uh, not oppose what should be combined 
and, uh, uh, and try to build, uh, through the resistance to the system, another kind of po possible system, uh, that is, which will not be limited to election and which go, will go in, into uh, economic uh, democracy also. Thanks a lot. And the mic goes on the left. Can, can we go there? Well, uh, I'm just uh, Gaspar Thomas from Hungary. Uh, I uh, uh, wonder whether we are not making it a little bit too easy. Um, just, just consider the following. If we take the best example of uh, the emancipatory tradition of direct democracy, which of course is the specific tradition of the left, in which, as you say, um, we have a workers' council, for example, in a, in, in, in a productive unit, in an enterprise, in a firm, and this is exactly where, indeed, the battles within the left have always been decided. It was three institutions, historic institutions of the left, have been based, not territorial in constituencies, but in enterprises, the trade union, the workers' council, and the communist party, right? All three, the battles, for example, in Poland, where were the battles? It was between the party organization in the enterprise and the solidarity cell. The solidarity, this is very important in Poland, was never a trade union. It was a network of workers' councils. It was called a trade union, but it was, never was. It was organized like the Communist Party by factory cell and territorial federation and not by branches, not by, by professional branches. No shoemaker solidarity. Yeah? And um, so, but, but what is the basis? What is the basis of direct democracy the created by the left? Well, the most alienated element of capitalism, result of social division of labor and of accumulation and creation of value, the capitalist enterprise. So are we, are we basing our emancipation at the real center of capitalism emulating its logistics and its strategy. How are those direct democracies linked? Because how the capitalist enterprises are linked, uh, well, through a mediated way, through the bloody market. How is it mediated between, between workers' councils? Well, we've seen the, with, the, with the experience of the Communist Party, how were the party cells integrated and mediated? Well, through authority, right? Well, this is not our way, is it? Is it? Uh, and, um, and, you know, how these things become institutional, as Catherine Samaré has said, of course, we can't go without institutions. Probably not. But what are institutions? Institutions are blueprints, in other words, depersonalized orders perhaps not linked necessarily to personal authority and chain of command, but what is more authoritarian than a blueprint or you know, an axiom in mathematics uh, according to which you just go on doing things like a technological blueprint or you know, so on. Now, so we are accepting, what are we accepting here through various kinds of representation or non-representation? Well, we are accepting without any further analysis the fact that what we need is power. Now, good. <laughs> what we need is power. Well, in order to, in order to get rid of it, right? That's the old, you know, problem of socialism. We are taking over the alienated enterprise, the alienated state, the authority system, the institutional blueprint. How are we making sure to keep our promise to use this in order to liberate? Because that was the promise of the Bolshevik party, which was, to put it very, very politely, was not kept in its entirety. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> now, now, the problem won't go away. We are still talking about taking over alienated elements of capitalism in their alienated character and the uh, last guarantee that this will be switched off, slipped over, it is that it will be ourselves. 
uh, who will take it over? Well, well, no, please, comrades, no. No, I don't think that we can, and here I, I, I agree with Thomas Seibert, that the central element, of course, it is capitalism. You cannot talk even, I know that for sake of brevity, mm -hmm. so dear to you, sake of brevity, of course, we can make, must make abstraction of this and that and other. Still, it's not only a methodological question, the question of substance, that are we to attack capitalism from its side where power is concentrated and, and neglecting, you know, the absolute historical mission of a communist or working class or whatever movement, which is, of course, to get rid of uh, the centrality of value and its most dire consequence, the division of labor and accepting specific roles. And, you know, accepting specific roles is the beginning of accepting hierarchy. Hierarchy. And, you know, uh, not everybody can do this and that. Of course, roles are being divided because, indeed, if indeed power is there, decisions will have to be taken. Time is yes. short. Yes, and okay. it's running is out. It? I have yes. to finish my contribution very soon because yeah. others. Are... Okay, that means, of course, that freedom is being curtailed and limited not by the ill will and the tyrannical <laughs> leanings of some people, <laughs> but by the structure itself which we are, even today, thinking of taking over. No. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, I will uh, abuse my power. Well, what's the power there? Uh, <laughs> the time, the clock. The clock is the power. Uh, okay, the last comment, please. Please, very brief. That question is fine, it won't be answered, but you go ahead. Right questions are really important. No, no, it's really, it's really important you ask a question. Yes, yes. Thank you for understanding that. Um, I have a question for the uh, two gentlemen from Belgium. Um, congratulations on G1000, but uh, I'm interested to know what was the most difficult part of actually doing it? Yeah. All right. Um, as far as the uh, gentleman um, over there, um, yeah. <laughs> in Bosnia, we have noticed, this is going to be short, I need to make an introduction yeah. because it's not a simple question. In Bosnia, we have noticed that people do not um, have faith or trust themselves. What I mean is when we um, present the idea of the direct democracy to someone who never heard of it, you know, he goes like, nah, people are too dumb. You know what I mean? And that is their excuse to... Um, just give away their power to somebody, you know, who is interested in it. I mean, it's not like something worse is going to happen. They're all already making it enough of a mess, you know. So having a, having a politician who is not interested in the uh, wellness of the people or the people who are not smart enough to, to make the right choices, I don't really see what, you know, the difference is. So the question is how to actually... Um, get people to not give their power away by thinking that they are not worthy of it or not smart enough. How long do I have to answer? Okay, and I, I would like to. I would like to now. I don't know. Is it abuse of power or whatever? But I'll, I'll, I'll decide this. So, can you answer in one minute or not? If you can't, yes. there's no answer. Yes. The okay. hardest part. Then you was have one minute, and then 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 the the Costas will have the closing word. Okay. Uh, just because I decided so. Uh, so I, you can have the closing word for three or four minutes, five. And tell us a bit about theory. Tell us about theory a bit you wanted to say. So we have one minute there and four or five there, and then we go to eat. Yes, please. Okay, hardest part was finding the money. Second hardest part was making sure that those in power were going to listen to you. So we had to create a lot of visibility through media to make sure that our voices were going to be heard. And I want to add to that something that was not so difficult was actually dealing with people who were not sympathetic for our event at the event itself. Uh, you mentioned what do you do when you have a racist around the table? Do you exclude these people? In fact, um, it, the people turned out to be less rational about their own behavior than you, you thought beforehand, even people who were racist. So you had them on the table once they, they were in the discussion, they, were, um, they were, felt they were taken seriously and were open to changing their opinions on certain issues. 
Right, so uh, change of plan, dynamic costas. Let's have one or two minutes each here, and then you have a closing, closing word. We hope we have the time for it, so, so we are fine. So you can have my mind. Yes. Um, I wanted to, uh, to try to answer with two stories, but there is not a lot of time for them. But one is the story of the new constitution of Iceland. I came back from Iceland two days ago, and where I'm studying a little bit how the new constitution works. It was done uh, with uh, several participatory moments. The first one was a project similar to, to there. Uh, to their project, uh, and then they passed to a self uh, uh, candidatures of people uh, that was elected by 37 percent of the population. It was not a very high turnout. That uh, destroyed a little bit the credibility of this popular commission who drafted the constitutions uh, and. The, the, um, the court, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, canceled the election of these people. And, uh, and the political new uh, social democrat government uh, confirmed all of them as appointed of the political power to write the constitution, saying, OK, we consider it valid that election. And this was a second step in uh, uh, lowering a little bit the credibility of this commission. But anyway, they work. They have done a, a, a good job. But uh, the studies on the composition of this uh, uh, 25 elected uh, uh, by 37% of the uh, Icelandic people uh, show that uh, 19 of them were well-known uh, people, actors, philosophers, journalists. Uh, so very few of them actually represented uh, uh, the, the common citizen as had happened in the previous phase of the Constitution when uh, the, the, the first committee was done uh, by a random selection of uh, citizens of different typology and different places. Uh, but anyway, uh, the process was very interesting. The result was interesting. Now the constitution has been for eight months uh, uh, like a hostage uh, of the political power who had to formally approve it. Uh, why? Because uh, in this procedure, uh, the social democrats did not never dialogue with uh, uh, the, the rights. Uh, they didn't do did any kind of concession. And now the right has the power to block all the constitutional uh, discussion. And so nothing is happening. The constitution was ready in 2010. We are in 2012 and the constitution is still there. And that's it because there was a wrong idea of passing all the power to the people when the institution and the same old constitution of Iceland set the rules for his reform. So um, there was a, a, like a schizophrenic uh, adaptation to the moment, the protest uh, in the squares in Iceland. So the political power decided to pass all the power to the people and now the constitution is stuck. The second case is the Tuscanian region, who had a very nice uh, and in important uh, uh, law on participation in 2007, approved after two years of discussion among the Tuscanian citizens. Uh, it's a very uh, progressive law, who starts saying that the participation is uh, a human right, and uh, this law tried to make it more effective. And uh, it creates uh, two uh, uh, channels. One for funding local authorities by the region in order to do process of particip participation in the discussion of local policies, which worked very well in these five years with more than 100 processes very vital and vibrant in the cities of Tuscany. And the second one was completely uh, uh, in disinflated and was a debat public in the French way that was uh, becoming compulsory for all the regional infrastructure if one of the mayor of the territory involved or a group of 100, 300, depending on the side of the city, citizens uh, were asking that to the region. So the region was self-obliging itself, yes, uh, was self-obliging to, uh, to, to do this participatory process if people was asking it. Nobody asked it along five years. 
So I'm wondering why. My parents, which are 80 years old and did a big battle in order to try to use this participatory tool, discovered that the movement, the leftist movement, did not want to use it because they prefer the traditional way of blocking the streets and being on the newspaper instead of working hard in a participatory process to negotiate the, uh, the infrastructure. And so if we don't start to use the instrument we have, we cannot complain that then the authorities are authoritarian. I mean, we have a lot of interesting things that we are, we are misusing. So I think that it's up to us to, yeah, yeah, to start, yeah, to start uh, a virtuous circle uh, also to better the institution we have. So. <clears throat> okay, I would like to make really two short comments on uh, what the friends on the panel said first. I think it is not enough to uh, give the homeless the possibility to be heard and speak in a round table, but it, it, they should be given a home and it's not uh, enough to pay them attention, but they, they should be paid a, pay, a basic income. So uh, maybe they, they, this is polemic. But. And uh, another comment on what the friends uh, from Bosnia said. Um, it reminded me also uh, in some ways of uh, um, students' protests I have uh, experienced, so that uh, um, you said people from the well-known parties and NGOs came and tear it apart, uh, the protests, and also the people would let them tear it apart. And uh, then I had to think of what the comrades of Sunas Pismos told, uh, told us. Uh, for example, at Yale Summer University, they spoke with us and uh, they said, okay, we go on the Syntagma Square, but our aim there is not to uh, somehow lead anything, but our first aim is to uh, be modest, to listen, and uh, to support with our experience that we have from our organizational experiences, uh, the movement that is happening there. And I think they've done it right. Thank you. Excellent. I agree. Okay. As the old guy, let me turn to some of the theoretical questions here. And uh, I think this wonderful discussion we had uh, reminded me of two in a sense, primordial sins of the left. Uh, the one is what I call left pessimism, and the second is the narcissism of small differences. Uh, left pessimism, you know, the idea that somehow we cannot intervene, particularly in the direct way that the Bosnian friend was saying, because somehow people have been made to feel stupid. And in a sense, that changed. I'll come to that in a minute, but let me say first something about the narcissism of small differences, and my friend here mentioned Laclau. Now, I'm a friend of both Laclau and Zizek, and I've been trying for the last five years to get them together, where I would be like Tony, I have the power, and make sure that you know, they end up agreeing. Because, and this is in a sense the third and the more, imp more important point I want to make, political intervention, particularly political intervention of, from the left, has always to take account of what Aristotle called the kairos, the opportune moment. The opportune moment differs you know, in Belgium and in Bosnia and in Greece. And it is precisely that sense of timely, timeliness, the, the correct position at the point at which certain conflicts and certain tensions become really acute, which is precisely the case in Greece. And when you get to that opportune moment, the idea that either Laclau or Zizek or Marx, God, uh, uh, God save us, has to be followed in all their particulars is absolutely wrong. Because you have, in that opportune moment, at which the social conflict, the social tension, creates the possibilities, the preconditions for the intervention of the left, you have, of course, to choose a number of strategies and types of intervention. So very broadly today we could say, and that is not just for Greece, although again in Greece it became quite obvious, you have within every European social formation a number of people who are totally excluded. Clearly the migrants, particularly the saint papier these are non-humans. They have absolutely no recognition within society. Then you have a large and increasing group of people that we could call the disenfranchised, the invisible, as I put it earlier. And of course this is now becoming a huge number of people. The precarité, what the the, 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 the French call precarité. We know that for the next 20 or 30 years, whole groups of the population, particularly the young people, are not going to get jobs. 
I mean, people beg to be exploited, to get a job because there's no jobs around. And these are people, as the Belgian colleagues were saying, who have the skills. This is the first time in human history that the people who, in Europe, about 60% have been to post-secondary education, have the skills and the abilities and the aptitudes that the leading groups and the elites have. We have exactly the same. And as we now learned over the last two or three years, a thousand unemployed lawyers and engineers and architects can become more revolutionary than a thousand unemployed workers. And this is the point at which you have now to intervene at that level, at the level even of the multitude, to use a term that I'm sure many of you would not like, that is now accepting that the promises they were given, that the life plans on which they worked and went and studied all the way to, you know, sort of PhDs and so on, are not going to work. There, clearly, you have to develop hegemonic type of policies a la la cloud. But when you move towards those who are clearly excluded, those who are totally invisible, then, of course, conflictual politics have to be there. And it seems to me that always the combination of the conflict, the hegemonic, and indeed the party intervention has to be combined. You cannot abandon it, one of these strategies just for the other. And, of course, as I said, the opportune moment, the timeliness will decide. But the final point about... Uh, about direct democracy in the way that I present mainly through the experience of the squares. And here is the only point in which I disagree with my friend here, because over the last few years, I keep, invi I keep being invited to conferences on complexity. Complexity is now big time in, uh, in social theory. Indeed, Cuba. Cuba, every January, has a big conference on complexity. And they invited me to go there. And of course, this idea of complexity is precisely against any idea of participation and understanding. In Syntagma, and I'm sure those of you who've been elsewhere and have been to many of these occupations, not just in Greece, the crowd, the multitude, showed that they're much wiser than any bloody intellectual or politician or economist. They could discuss all kinds of issues. They could understand what was at stake. And they did not expect the economists, which, as we know anyway, are split between the neoliberals, the Keynesians, the left Keynesians, and the Marxists. And therefore, each one of them has a different view of the world. The multitude could understand and indeed decide on issues. It is precisely that kind of idea that we, the people, you know, things are so bloody complex, you know, you cannot understand them, you need the experts, you need the technocrats to tell us, you need those, you know, once you have government to create policy and so on. At the level of political confrontation, political action, you just need people to come together to listen to what they're saying and create will formation. And I said a word that I hate because it comes from Habermas, but let me accept it now. So you, they create will formation. So the very final point, how do you move there? The difference between our age and epoch and society from what was happening in 68 or some of the earlier, the, the, the anti-colonial movement and so on is this. In biopolitical neoliberal capitalism, what the system, let's call it now, capitalism creates is subjectivities. What it really controls is conduct, comportment, behavior. Ideas, in a sense, are free. You can't be, and as we know, of course, fascists are everywhere. You know, fascistic ideas are free. We heard that in Hungary, in Greece, in Croatia, and so on. But once you are fully in agreement or you accept a way of behaving and acting, basically, unless you become a terrorist, you are accepted. So that is the importance of the squares, which for me are very different than the Occupy movements from, say, the 1960s, and the civil rights movement of the anti-Vietnam War. Because disobedience today means for ordinary people that they find this split in themselves between what elites and the law and the power systems tell and a certain sense of ethics, which however, in order to operate, must first disengage you, disarticulate you from that kind of comportment and behavior. And that is why for me, I think, these occupations and squares and indignados are a proper duty, are a preparation for a later revolutionary struggle. Because once you have been disengaged from that idea of consumption, of debt, of acting correctly, whatever you believe, then the next steps are, are, are possible. And to that extent, 
Europe now is different, and Europe is now going into a really conflictual situation. So while I have absolutely no advice or solution to give to my Belgian friends or the Bosnian friends or the Croatian or anyone else, I would say, let us prepare. We are getting into a conflictual situation and taking account of the specificities of each country with its own history, with its own social formation and its own struggles, to see how we can move towards that idea of desubjectification and resubjectification. Taking people from that anonymity of I'm doing okay, who cares, and so on, and putting them in front of the questions and the problems and the conflicts that now are facing all of us, although in different forms in each day. I'm really optimistic. That's why I mentioned uh, pessimism, left pessimism at the beginning. Remember, only three or four years ago, could we have that kind of discussion we have now? Why did we get here? Not because the left parties, including Syriza, which I supported all my life in the different transubstantiations, in a sense, became so important. It is because people went out in the squares without, as uh, the, 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 the series of person was saying earlier, my friend uh, Harris, not because the party told them. Now, that is a great victory. It's a great, in a sense, weakening and undermining that kind of subjectification. And I think here we have, my friends, we of the left, the responsibility, but also the great honor, of saving the idea of Europe because the idea of Europe has been abandoned to the neoliberals in Frankfurt and Berlin and Brussels, and we of the left, in a sense, are now fighting for some of the great achievements of, uh, of the European tradition and so on, as, of course, a preparation for a more socialist and a different kind of society. So we have great responsibilities. There is no common blueprint. There is no common plan or strategy that we should all adopt but we have precisely to look into our specific situations and choose the struggles that can then become generalized. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Gosses. Now, I think it's a, it's a note worthy of closing the panel, and I would like to invite the uh, uh, people here, uh, participants with the organization, to that lunches. Uh, organized now, wherever the organizers will lead us to, and then 3.30 is the next session here, so half past three, please. Thank you.